Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. everyone it's uh, Roxanne I have a uh, someone that I've known actually goodness Mike I'm trying to think of how long we've known each other uh, Mike Strange Mike is uh, has, is uh, someone that's been in uh, the Niagara community and has done some pretty big things in the world in my opinion so Mike thanks for joining me on uh, my show today oh thanks for having me Roxanne appreciate it so Mike I you know I'm going to tell you some of the things that I know about Mike but um, I want Mike to uh, share with you what uh, he's been up to Mike is um, been in the Niagara community for a very long time I remember being at the hospital and us watching you at the hospital and you were boxing that's you know everybody stopped to watch you box when you were at the Olympics and so Mike is a um, Olympic uh, boxer he is also a part of city council and he has ran across Canada f- for Children's cancer. Is that what it was, Mike, that you did? Yes, as well as uh, Ronald McDonald House. Yes. Ronald McDonald House. And recently, um, the power of social media, right? So um, I, you know, I'm on Mike's uh, Facebook and um, I'd heard about the box run, but it's one thing, you know, when you hear about it. And so this is, uh, I want him to talk about that. But he was, I've also heard about the El Camino and then, of course, getting intrigued by the El Camino, and then when you were there running, and then, you know, when you were sweaty and couldn't breathe and all that stuff, it really just kind of brought it to light about the importance of uh, following the passions in your heart, what, what's important to you. So that's why I wanted Mike to come on and chat a little bit with, with us today. So Mike, I don't know, you know, I've obviously missed a lot of things about you, but what, what are the things that should people know about you that are listening? Well, I, I was... Uh... I was on the national boxing team for many, many years. I participated in uh, three Olympic games, um, uh, finished fifth in Atlanta. That was my best result. And it was kind of a controversial decision. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, when I was 10 years old, I, uh, I got in the sport of boxing and I was, you know, competing, you know, I was at St. Mary's elementary school here in Niagara Falls and small school, you know, hundred kids. And, um, you know, didn't know if I wanted to excel in boxing. I was playing, uh, soccer and hockey at the same time. I was a goaltender. And, um, you know, in 1984, I just remember watching the uh, Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles and watching two of my idols, uh, Sean O'Sullivan and Willie DeWitt, who ended up winning two silver medals for Canada and watching these guys and on the top of the, you know, the second on top of the podium, and the, the flag being risen, and just thinking, wow, I wish I could get to that level someday but you know when you're a kid you're you think you got to go to some special olympic school or something like that so i ended up uh kind of giving up uh hockey and, and soccer and still wonder how i would have done if i would have kept up with those sports but I went on with the sport of boxing and um you know you, you set goals for yourself uh, to get to the olympic games you have to obviously set many goals for yourself so first one was to go to the uh, ontario provincial championships and try to win them in your particular weight class and uh, an age group, and I did, and I won, and I ended up going to the uh, national championship, so competed against all the other provinces in my age group and weight class, and made it all the way to the finals, and lost to a boxer from Quebec, but, you know, I was second in Canada, which was uh, pretty amazing, and, um, you know, I trained harder, and then the next year, I made it all the way to the finals again, and lost to another boxer from Quebec, so the French guys were beating me up in the finals. <laughs> um, but in, in uh, you know, in 1987, I ended up uh, going to the provincials and winning them and going to the nationals. And they were in St. John's, Newfoundland, and uh, ended up winning uh, the national championships as a, as a junior. Um, so I was, uh, you know, 17. And I, you know, once you're a national champion, you begin to travel all over the world boxing for Team Canada, wearing the red and white. And um, which was just amazing and went to so many different countries representing Canada. And um, so I was gearing up for the senior level to get up to the Olympic Games. And uh, my first chance was to go to the 1992 Olympic Games 
uh, in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, I, you know, just to get to the Olympics uh, that particular year, they started, you had to not qualify through, all, not only qualify through Canada, but you had to qualify through North America and South America as well. So you had to finish in the top five in your weight class, which back then was featherweight. And um, I qualified, which was amazing. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I was just getting out of high school at that time at Stanford Collegiate in Niagara Falls and a little bit of a cocky kid. And, um, you know, I was telling, remember going to the Barcelona Olympics and telling people, I'm going there, I'm going to win a gold medal, I'm going to come back, I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn professional, I'm going to be a world champion and make millions. And, well, you know, you go to these big, big Olympic games and, and you see them on TV and, you know, they have the opening ceremonies where you enter through the tunnel and there's like 80,000 people cheering for you. And I remember being in that lineup in 92 and, man, it was, um, you know, I'm about one out of 300 Canadian athletes getting ready and we're, you know, 10th down the line from going in alphabetical order and they announced Canada and going up the tunnel and I just froze and never had kind of had that experience before and wasn't prepared for it. And um, two days later, I, my first boxing match, I lost and I was done. There was, in boxing, there's no second chance. Once you lose, you're done. So, you know, I came back, you know, from Barcelona to Canada and not winning a gold medal and not going to turn professional and not going to make millions and realize, you know, that you have to, you know, seeing all these great track suits and, you know, that you're competing for in Canada and all these trophies and medals, but, you know, in the end, that's not going to pay your bills. So, you know, schooling was obviously very important. So, you know, I kept on with that, but also kept with my boxing career and um, being, began to get more experience internationally boxing for Canada um, and then went on to uh, the next Olympic Games were uh, in Atlanta in 96. And uh, I was well prepared. I was uh, ranked uh, fifth in the world at the time going to, the, to those uh, trials. And I went through, won the uh, the trials and won the North America, South American championships. So I went there and um, uh, it, it was just uh, amazing. So I go to Atlanta and it's just pick out of the hat who you type, who you, who you box, like bingo balls, you know, number you're fighting <laughs> yeah. Mexico. And I ended up winning against Mexico and then um, fighting another boxer from Armenia and, and beat him. And then I was in the quarterfinals boxing a Bulgarian, uh, Tancho Tanchev and, uh, I went in and, you know, the, the judging, the head official of the judging, the guy was from Bulgaria, so from his home country, ended up losing the match when I, I thought I should have won. And a lot of people from Canada thought I should have won and very upset because, you, you know, you, four years of your life, you're training your butt off and, you know, the judges kind of take it away from you. And, um, you know, just like, you know, figure skating, you know, synchronized swimming, the judges can – um, take it away from you and we put a protest in but um, nothing happened he went on to go and win a silver medal um, so I think I should have won at least a silver medal so it was, I was so upset you know crying very upset and not wanting to do the sport anymore um, and uh, you know I started getting a lot of letters and uh, emails um, to the Olympic Village when I was in Atlanta the last few days and you know they're saying Mike keep your head held high you should have won that match you know keep going and I got a particular email from my idol Willie DeWitt he was the, mm. the reason why I got into boxing why why I want to go Olympics because it was this guy and he basically just said you know turn negatives into positives um you know in life you're going to go through that you know whether it may be you know getting laid off from a job um uh, getting fired stuff happens in life that it's not fair and uh, this certainly wasn't fair and I was just like man this guy went out of his way to send me this and um so I decided to give it another shot and in the meantime I met this this guy his name was Bob Lavelle and his nickname was Heater and Heater was a friend of my father's and he was a very uh he was a mentor of mine and he worked for Bell Mobility at the time so he actually gave me a cell phone when cell phones just started coming out to kind of <laughs> yeah. keep in contact with your friends and family and media while you're away boxing. And he actually got me to go to train in, in, um, in Toronto and, um, and, you know, he saw the potential, but you know, you need a little help, you know, as an amateur boxer, any amateur a athlete that represents Canada, you don't get paid a lot. So, you know, you're working full time or going to school full time as well as training full time. So, 
um, heater, Bob helped me out quite a bit. It was amazing. And then, you know, I went on to, to uh, go to the 1998 Commonwealth Games in Malaysia and won the gold medal there. And, you know, just remember being on the top of the podium, listening to the national anthem, blaring the flag being risen. I remember watching Donovan Bailey and a few others when they won and they were, you know, crying. And I said, oh, if that ever happens, I don't remember, you know, I'll never cry. Well, I got up there and I cried like a little baby. I, you know, so proud of uh, representing Canada, win the gold medal and bringing it back to, uh, to kick to Canada and in particular Niagara Falls. And um, it was because of heater that really helped me out. And I ended up going to uh, my last Olympic games, which was in Sydney, Australia in 2000. And um, it was a tough draw. I, I drew the second best boxer in the world and I lost, lost legitimately, but it was because of heater that really helped me out um, to get to those last Olympic games and win the gold medal. And, you know, after that, I, 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 became a real estate agent and uh, trained boxers myself and, um, you know, wasn't sure what the future, you know, had in store for me. And in 2008, um, Heater or Bob, he, he asked me to go to the Olympics in Beijing as a spectator because his niece was competing uh, for baseball, uh, Caitlin uh, Lever. Um, so I said, yeah, I'd love to, you know, just let me time and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I was waiting a few weeks and I haven't heard from Heater. So I phoned Heater and I said, Heater, what's going on? I'm waiting to see, you know, what's going on. If we're going to go to Beijing and, and, uh, and watch your niece. And he said, Mike, I got this pain in my shoulder. That's brought me to my knees. And I always knew Heater is a big, big guy, strong, you know, nothing affecting him. And he said, well, you, you know, obviously you got to get that checked out. And he phoned me a few days later and he says, Mike, I got diagnosed with cancer. Oh, okay. And, you know, I didn't know much about cancer and, um, you know, it was uh, heartbreaking and he didn't know where the cancer kind of stemmed from the original spot, but you know, he found out that it was pancreatic cancer. If there's a cancer you don't want, that's the cancer. And, um, you know, went through all the treatments and everything. And he had some high profile guys who were helping him out. They were player fair and, and uh, an NHL hockey player in the States who was going through great treatment, but you know, eight short months, uh, he passed away and, and, uh, I was really, really devastated. I remember being at the visitation and just like, it didn't hit me until I got there and I was just bawling my eyes out. And I remember Dougie Gilmore uh, coming, who's an ex-Toronto Maple Leaf and friends of Heater and coming up and hugging me and, and you know, just said, it was all, you know, Heater was always proud of you. And, you know, and so I thought, I remember after his funeral, I thought, what can we do to kind of carry on Heater's legacy? He did so much for children and, and charities and helping athletes like myself. So I decided, um, to start an event at Oaks Park in Niagara Falls called Heaters Heroes Run for Children. And basically it was like a mini uh, kind of wish foundation where uh, mm -hmm. we would help kids who had uh, terminal illnesses or life altering illnesses or injuries. And uh, they would basically just walk or run or whatever they could do around uh, the 400 meter track around the soccer pitch at Oaks Park here in Niagara Falls. And uh, so we did it and we had 13 children and uh, we got a committee together and we raised, I think it was over $13,000 that first year. And we helped different uh, kids. But this one little girl, Kelsey Hill, she got a direct impact on me. And, um, you know, she had a brain uh, tumor and um, she was half paralyzed. Um, and uh, she had a patch over her eye. And, and you know, she, she participated in, in her wish and her family's wish was just to have a uh, uh, chairlift from where she was sleeping to the bathroom because they were on different levels. So we made that happen. And I actually pushed her in the Terry Fox run about a month later after that at the same park, uh, ironically at Oaks Park. And uh, we came so close and on Facebook all the time. And, you know, she was only 12 at the time. And um, I was at the volunteer kind of party after that we were uh, at the Falls of Hose Brigade in Niagara Falls, and you know these volunteers get there just to kind of thank them for the event at Oaks Park, and um, you know had a few pops, <laughs> and we were celebrating a little bit, and I remember just thinking, you know, putting everything together about Heater and about this poor little girl from Kelsey Hill and what she was going through, and me pushed her in the Terry Fox run, and and then Terry Fox really just kind of hit me. I said, Does anyone ever? And we knew Terry that started his marathon of hope back in 1980, April 12th. And he made it all the way. He was try attempting to uh, run across Canada with his prosthetic. 
and he made it all near all the way near Thunder Bay and was forced to stop. And I said, has anyone ever kind of continued his run? So we're all Google it that day and um, and no one had. And it was like, I was just like right that second. I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Wow. So I remember November 1st, uh, 2011, um, I started running and mm-hmm. um, it was, I was just training for this run and I haven't told anybody about it really. And, you know, so I, you know, I want, kind of wanted to implement what Terry Fox did, you know, 32 years before and try to run a marathon a day. And in boxing, we always ran five miles as fast as we can. And that was it. But here you got to obviously pace yourself. You want to run a marathon a day. So I started running and I remember just starting and my long run would be 30 kilometers and it would take, you know, like three hours. And I remember seeing my one friend, Mike Majewski, and he, he was out with his family like at like nine in the morning, he saw me. And then like three hours later, he saw me still running. He's like, Mike, what are you doing? I said, I was out shopping. I come out and you're still running. I go, I'm thinking about doing this run. I'm not sure. Didn't really fill him in. And, um, well, in December, we, I got a horrible call from Kelsey's mom that um, Kelsey's mom, Lana Hill, said Kelsey passed away this morning. And I was just, oh, another, you know, more devastating news. And, um, you know, I said, you know, if I was thinking about it, I'm definitely doing it now. And, you know, to run across Canada, you obviously need support and didn't really know what I needed. So did my research on, so you know, trying to get an RV because you obviously got to sleep in places and, um, you know, on different stops to, uh, you know, people got to cook for you. And, and I wanted to go to different schools. So I needed people to arrange that on social media. So I got a core group of people together and, um, and I phoned my buddy, Tim Geddes. And Tim is a big, big guy, one of my best friends. I've known him since grade nine. He like John Candy, funny, funny guy. So there's a guy you want out there and, and kind of, um, you know, keep the things enjoyable while you're doing it. It's Tim. And um, mm-hmm. when I phone him, he says, Mike, of course, I'd love to help you. And he goes, in fact, my son's friend, Matteo Mancini, has the same cancer as Terry Fox. He's getting his leg amputated in two days. Oh, and wow. he was only 11 years old. So, I, you know, he's from Thorold. And I said, it just kind of never ends, you know, stemming from Peter now to Kelsey, now to Mateo. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great? Because my plan was to start April 12th, uh, 2012. So it would be 32 years to the date that Terry dipped his leg in the Atlantic Ocean. And I was hopefully going to continue his run from near Thunder Bay where he's forced to stop. So that was the date we were looking for. So we got together and I thought, wouldn't it be great if Mateo could come out? Uh, You know, we know he's got to go through treatment at McMaster for, uh, for chemo and and flying back and forth. Um, but what a great legacy it would be for Mateo. And um, Mateo's parents were kind of going through a separation at the time. And you see that a lot happening with, with kids who fight mm-hmm. cancer. Their parents have obviously, um, it's, it's tough to stay together because it's so uh, stressful, you know, mentally and, and, you know, going through financially. So when we approached uh, Mateo and I said, this is what we want to do. And, and his mom was like, absolutely not you're not taking my baby anywhere from me as he's fighting cancer and going through this and Mateo they saw a look in his eyes he says mom I want to be the next Terry Fox so it's kind of something they they couldn't say no so we uh we had several meetings um we held them at the Falls Rehose Brigade which I'm a member at in Niagara Falls and um kind of what we wanted to uh, do and accomplish and where our money wanted to go we weren't sure and what we wanted to call it, you know, my initial uh, thing, uh, kind of title for it was uh, Mateo and Mike's journey to KO cancer, to KO childhood cancer. We got to the meeting and it was about probably about two weeks before I was supposed to leave. I planned leaving. So I ended up getting an RV donated um, from the family. And, and, uh, um, and when I went, we had this meeting and my buddy, Andy Bird, who's kind of a, uh, business guy and and um, he he knows the stuff. He goes to China and he, he does some import and export and stuff. And he goes, Mike, I like the uh, what you're doing. I think it's great. He goes, I I the name I'm not sure about. He goes, I I don't think. Say you wanted to continue this after this, how can you do that with that kind of name and keep it going? So we came up with kind of a logo and it it was box run. I'm a boxer. I ran ran with fox and it was just kind of you yeah. know out, thinking outside the box and it was so many different meetings uh box run running for the fight um i was like wow i love it you know what i mean there was there was one person that really liked it and then afterwards he kind of got on board um 
But then there was a couple of people that were just like ne really negative. That were my friends. They're like, Mike, you're going to lose, you know, I was running a bar at the time. You're going to mm -hmm. lose your job. Um, how are you going to afford to do this? Um, you know, it needs more preparing. And I just said, listen, guys, I will get my backpack right now. I'll start running right from this hall. I'm prepared. I've been running. I've been doing this. I've been training for four months. So I'm ready to do it. Well, you know, they all kind of changed their, when I was so positive and, and motivated them kind of. So we had a, um, you know, kind of a going away party where we raised like $15,000 right away, which was really amazing. And one day and within a week we did it and it was crazy. So we got our, our RV and we, uh, we drove to Thunder Bay and it was on April 10th that we drove, got there at April 11th. And a lot of people don't know, but Terry Fox never made it to Thunder Bay. He actually named it, made it to this little town in uh, Scriber or in uh, uh, Shunya. And there's a little post there where he ended and it says, you know, uh, of the mileage and the date that he ended, which is September 1st, 2080. And it took us two or three times to drive past this post. So we ended up meeting with the mayor of, uh, of Shunya and there was actually a, a, um, a petition because they wanted to move this post because the two lane highway, they wanted to move in a four lane highway. So I signed the petition. And Mateo wasn't there at the time because he, we had to fly him in because he couldn't be in the RVs for 17 hours on a, on a trek up there. So we waited for them. We signed the petition. And, you know, I think, you know, to, to move this post, Terry Fox is the biggest hero of all time in Canada. That's, you know, I think there should be a holiday named after him, right? Um, so I signed the petition. I said, if anyway, if you're going to put this two lane into a four lane, you know, move the post in the middle and have a Tim Hortons. You can't get more Canadian than that. You know, it would be awesome. So yeah, we, uh, it was kind of funny because so we were measuring the uh, so we started in Shunya and we were supposed to meet the morning and, and Mateo came back the, the, the night of on the 11th. So in the morning on the 12th, we stayed in, in uh, Thunder Bay at a, at a hotel, which, which a lot of people were donating. So someone donated a hotel in, in Thunder Bay. So we drove and measured it out from the point where he was forced to stop to the big, huge statue of Terry Fox in, uh, in Thunder Bay. And it was, uh, Approximately, I think it was eight kilometers or yeah, eight kilometers we measured. So I, I said, oh, I can run that, no problem. So we're meeting the mayor of Shunya and then meeting the mayor of Thunder Bay. So I had about, a, a, you know, an hour and a half so we met and, and the, the girls, the mayor of Shunya is like, you better get going. You got to, you know, like 14 kilometers. I'm like, no, we measured it. It's like eight kilometers. Well, we didn't realize that our RV was an American RV. It was measuring miles oh okay so right away we we're like oh my god and i got you know tim gettys who he was trying to convert uh miles to kilometers i know i was going a lot more than marathons at the time but nonetheless i made it to uh to the statue that day on time and there was a, a you know a little bit of a crowd um you know it wasn't much but we met the mayor and there was some film there and um they were filming uh mateo and and t talking to him and he's very positive um and then um, Mateo uh, left and he went back to McMaster for his treatments. So we were planning to get, so the next, next kind of major city that Mateo would come in would be Winnipeg and then we'd go to Regina, Calgary, and then have him in Victoria and have him dip his leg in the ocean like Terry Fox did 32 years before. And um, so Mateo left and so I started running and, and Northern Ontario, the hills are huge. So basically I would run to the RV and then we'd do eight and a half kilometers five times a day um to make up that marathon so i'd run and it'd be on the side of the highway and I'd run it by myself and these hills were you know i thought you know running up clifton hill the training and stuff i was doing was going to be enough in fireman's park to be enough for these hills in northern ontario which they weren't it was brutal and i right away you know i was uh my legs were getting really sore and you know so every eight and a half kilometers i stopped for like 15 20 minutes and then on my third leg which would be you know like 25 kilometers i stopped for lunch and then, um, you know, I do that extra two legs and then, you know, I'd be done for the day. And, you know, it was so tough, especially the last couple of legs where you're just running and, um, you know, the physical part was really tough at the beginning. And then, uh, you know, we got to where I remember getting caught in a blizzard the sixth day we were there. We couldn't get kicked off the highway, but, but we knew we were on schedule. So I was running on the highway and basically it was blocked off and the cops basically kicked us off. Um, and yelling at us, swearing at us. And they saw basically on the side of the RV what we were doing. They said, guys, we know what you're doing. It's a great cause, but you know, we're out here for your safety. You couldn't even see it. I'm running in this like foot 
uh, snow on on the on the highway, highway number one, the Trans Canada Highway, and um, so we ended up finishing the marathon that day, which was pretty extraordinary because we had to come back about four or five hours later until it was all cleared out. But we, uh, you know, and the the mental it started getting really mentally tough, you know, after a week or so as we're getting towards you know the Manitoba border because you know these just hills are huge and you're by yourself and you know I'm what listening. Ha- what, to ha- what happens to you mentally? Because, like, I mean, I know obviously you're an Olympian and you know, like, but mentally, what happens to you when physically you're that tired? What, tell me what happens in your head. Well, you're just thinking, and, and music was a big part of it at first. So I would have, you know, 50, 60 songs that I'm listening to. And, you know, my favorite songs were, you know, Running on Empty was one of my favorite by Jackson Brown. You know what I mean? And Against the Wind, mm-hmm. uh, Bob Seeger. Right. So I, every time you get something, you're like, okay, you know, and I'd be thinking, I put my Kelsey Hill shirt on or think of Mateo and thinking of what these kids had to go through and I'd suck it up and get through and get through the end of the day and okay. And then, you know, just, you know, the food, the nutrition, right? I'm losing weight and you're trying to eat as much as you can, but you know, you're burning 5,000 calories a day. It's, it's impossible to consume that. So you're losing weight and you're losing strength, but, um, the mental part got over the physical part, you know, you're fighting through it. So you just, you just kept in your mind, this is bigger than me. Um, this is about, you know, heater. This is about Kelsey. This is about Mateo. And that's, is that what, you know, when you're, I'm sure physically, like I've, I was listening to you when you were in Spain and I was like, wow, like, you know, because your body's fighting against you in every way, like you said, but you still somehow in your mind kept that image of what you wanted to achieve. Yeah, and it was amazing because, and, and, you know, even in the second one, which I'll be talking about, but every time that I felt like I can't do this anymore, I'd get some kind of message or an email and we'd have a blog on, on Facebook and we would do videos. And, you know, the, since the social media has changed so much from Facebook and that, like we had, we brought a guy, a videographer there and he would have to film us at the end and I donate or dedicate every day to someone who has, uh, you know, was fighting cancer, passed away from cancer. I put flags, Canadian flags from the dollar store on the highway. And I know there's still a couple uh, taped up to uh, some poles and stuff. So I dedicate uh, um, to, uh, to a child and put a word of the day, like strength or courage. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was great. And we do a blog, but they would have to, this video, it's, it, it's amazing when you think about now, they would have to condense it. It would take like eight or nine hours to put this like 30 second video of me dedicating something and put it on Facebook. And people were, were on Facebook were like, Mike, I can't sleep unless, and we were like two or three days behind sometimes because of these videos. It took a lot, a lot to do. So everyone's like, I can't sleep unless I get to your, your video blog at night. So, um, you know, and, and just the, uh, the mental part, going up these hills, just looking for the RV and not seeing it going down a hill and looking back up there, there's the RV. It's like, oh, I need a little bit of rest. And, you know, and um, re-energize and food and drinks and whatever I can get in my body and, um, you know, and, and praying for flat land. Well, guess what? In Manitoba, I got my wish because now I can see my RV five kilometers away and it's not getting any closer because there's no hills at all. Right, you know? right. But uh, it started picking up the box run started to pick up momentum as we got into Manitoba. We started getting requests from schools, which was great. Media was coming out and uh, interviewing me on the side of the road about the cause and we're getting donations. Um, and it was, it was amazing. And, um, but now it was getting tougher for me because now I'm going to talk to schools, which are an hour away. We would take the RV we take an hour, go talk for an hour, set up, and then come back. Now that's mm-hmm. not your so Now these five-hour runs are turning into like nine-hour runs and getting mm-hmm. interviewed and stuff. So it was really, you know, sometimes you lose focus of why you're doing it because you're so exhausted. And I'm like, I don't want to talk. You know, I, I just want to be left alone. But that was part of it, part of the whole thing. You know, you get people like Tim reminding me, this is why we're doing it. Like, you know, we would fight with each other a bit on the RV, you know, and just over stupid stuff. I just wanted to rest and and Tim is very, very ADD and he's just like constantly on you. Right. And he's, you know, running, you know, walking back and forth and you don't realize that he's cooking the whole time or doing my laundry stuff that a lot of people don't want to be doing. Right. What an amazing, what an amazing thing though, Mike, you know, like in all fairness, I knew a little bit about the box run, but this, this is a, what an amazing story because, you know, <clears throat> 
physically, like obviously you know what it is to tax your body. And then, and, you know, at some point the mind takes over for you. And it's, it, you know, for the average person, like, you know, that's maybe listening to this, it's probably hard for them to understand what it takes, but it takes, you go into a mental space that allows you to stay focused. Yeah, yeah. It, it really did. And, and it got really tough and we got to Winnipeg. Um, we got gained more momentum and um, there was more people coming out and helping out because, you know, Tim had to leave, we'd bring other people on and, and so, or, or someone else would come out and help Tim. Um, but when we got to Winnipeg, that was for where Terry Fox's family was from. Um, and so the reaction from they had schools and we were at city hall and Mateo went in Mateo came in. He was like a little rock star, curly hair, like Terry Fox. We were on TV, breakfast, television, radio. And, um, he was great. Mateo was, was amazing. And it was gaining a lot of momentum. It really was. And then, you know, a couple of day, days there and then, um, Mateo had to go back. And so now the next time we were going to see him was in Regina so we continued running and, and uh, yeah, it started getting a lot of momentum, boxing gyms, schools, everybody wanted me there. And, and it was, it was great. We we're just telling the story of why I was doing this mm -hmm. and um, got the brand in Manitoba and I, the mental part started getting really bad. So my buddy, Jack Robson um, came in, he's from Niagara Lake and he was doing a lot of the, the uh, pre preparing for schools and social media stuff. He would be cooking and, and stuff like that or driving the RV. And um, got to one point, I had about four kilometers left to one day. I said, Jack, I said, get some shoes on, buddy. You're running with me those last four. I'm by myself. It's killing me being by myself. You know, it's almost too, too much time to think, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Running every day by yourself. You're driving yourself crazy. And um, Jack's like, I don't have any shoes. I go, what size yet? He goes, size nine. I go, I got 12 pairs there from people <laughs> donating to me, and I'm size nine. You're getting a pair of shoes on. And at the time, I think he was 43, not athletic. Um, he smoked for almost 28 years. Well, he came out, he ran and almost killed him. He had to actually run, walk, run, walk. He was, and he'd do that almost every day to help me out the last four kilometers. And he came up to eight, he was making more money than I was doing the box run from friends because they couldn't believe this guy was running. <laughs> and he quit smoking that day and to this day. Wow. And, yeah, which is pretty amazing. So, uh, you know, I think um, I inspired him by, you know, getting him out and doing that. And then, you know, he inspired me by stop smoking. He knew we were out here for, you know, childhood cancer research and, um, you know, to stop smoking is obviously a, a, a big thing, right? So it's for hard, him, it's this, to this day, to since 2012, he hasn't had a cigarette. Wow, wow. Really so you, I mean, truly inspirational, right? Because you're, you're running because of kids that are developing cancers for a lot of different reasons, but we know that smoking is such, you know, it's a big thing that takes a lot of people's lives. So for him, just because yeah. you needed him, it, it, it created a shift. What, what, a, what a gift that um, was able to happen on, on that experience. Well, it sounds like there was a lot of gifts that happened there, Mike. There was, yeah. And, and, you know, he did inspire me by doing that and chews a lot of gum now. I know that, <laughs> but he doesn't smoke. But after that, and, and we were heading to uh, Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan wasn't very good as far as, uh, you know, media and stuff like that. And there's a lot of, when you're we're running on the highway, so we get a little shoulder of the road, there's big trucks going by and it was freezing and the wind going East to West, the wind is always in your, always in your face, always in your face. And it would feel like, you know, there was 90 kilometer winds in my face. And, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, really tough. And it just, you know, you're, you feel like you're, you're walking because it's so strong this wind. And then you got trucks going by and splashing you and your mud and, you know, um, and then you have cities that, you know, we're used to Niagara Falls, Lincoln into St. Catharines, that's links into another city. Well, there's, hundreds of kilometers where there's no city it's just you and this rv and, and the highway and uh you know you'd stay in the rv some nights or in hotels and you know at least i gotta look look forward to um mateo coming in regina and when we got to regina um we got some horrible news uh mateo's mom phoned and says he can't mateo can't come anymore his uh his cancer spread from his from his legs to his lungs so they found uh tumors in his lungs and you know exactly the same as terry fox so he wasn't coming back anymore and i just remember me and tim and it was just me and tim at that point in time and we we're just bawling our eyes so and um 
we actually ended up going to a to a bar and i remember having a few few beers and we were drinking shots of zambuca <laughs> and uh, crying and i remember my yeah. my my one buddy andy the guy who came up with the box run the kind of logo and the idea he says you know this is the reason why you're out there for kids like mateo and you know, so I'm crying. At one point, I think the bartender thought that me and Tim were breaking up because we were crying. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty comical. But I remember the next morning waking up and with a bad hangover and having to run. And, and mm. man, that was one of the toughest days for sure because I was running and it was not nice out. And, you know, and not a lot of people were out and running down Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. There's so much wind in my face and just crying and, and looking up and just saying, you know, leave this kid alone. You know, you took his legs and now you spread it to his lungs. Just give this kid a break. Well, Mateo phoned me like two days later. He goes, I'll switch spots if you want. So it's one of those oh, things. Is that, you know, is that, oh, wow. I couldn't really quit, right? So, so that just gave you the extra mental, like, you know, and, and you know, I just think yeah, about, so you, you know, and, it, and, and, and it was like those type of things when, when I thought, you know, maybe I can't do it or I feel like quitting that you get a call and, and it's just something that happened. That's like, okay, well, now I got this boost, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I listen and I'm, I'm inspired, you know, just listening to what you're saying because, you know, so much, so many of us, have gone through stuff, right? Like you said, we've all gone through stuff or people that are listening now are going through stuff. They will go through stuff. If you're not going through it yourself, somebody else you know is going through it. You're losing a child or lost a child. I mean, devastating, right? But what I hear is that, you know, you just have done things that have um, cut through uh, a lot of things to enable you to be able to, to give the gift of, um, a voice to these children that you know that are losing their lives which is what would you say to someone listening that is going through a tough time right now mike and they're thinking i, I don't know you know I, I don't know how i'm gonna i don't know if i'm gonna literally put one foot in front of you know of each other whether it's a child listening or a teen or a parent what would you say to them well you know what we always you know and part of our keywords um you know and a few of the flags is hope and there are hope and it, it, there is hope out there and and we've i've seen it with children who you know one makes it and one doesn't unfortunately mm -hmm. but the, the, the treatment is getting better um mm -hmm. you know unfortunately it's not getting fast enough mm -hmm. um there is a uh, treatment that are in, that's in the states you know the t-cell therapy and and the stem cell research is really really helping out um mm -hmm. with uh with the childhood cancer um, you know, but there are certain, certain, um, cancers that really haven't, hasn't gone and improved like osteosarcoma, which is one of the, the tough cancers, the bone cancer for, for children. And, you know, it's, you know, we have a few in Niagara Falls that are, that are going through it and, um, it's really tough. It really, really is. And, but there are, there is support and, um, you know, we, there's different, uh, I know Wellspring here in Niagara really helps out families. Uh, Ronald McDonald House, which is one of our charities that we give to in in, uh, in Hamilton, is just amazing. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you think of the, you know, the the burden obviously of having someone sick, whether it be cancer or any illness, and and it's a child, and um, you know now you got to pay for parking, you got to look for a place to stay because there's always somebody you got to has to stay with a child at the hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, hot, of course, the bed, and so. You know, to give some relief from the families where they can park for free at Ron McDonald House and they're just steps away from McMaster and they stay for $13 a night, which is wow. great. And they're, they're not funded through government. So it's up to, you know, myself, which I thought was a, a great uh, uh, charity to give to. Um, and it's amazing. And, and I know so many children that have stayed there and their families and it really, really um, takes a burden off them, especially uh, financially. You know so so you know the box run it has now been around for a long time and for people you know wanting to connect or um you know and you're you, i feel remiss in not knowing the entirety of your story what an amazing story my yeah, I could, I could be i've known you now you. for how long yeah. mike lived down the street from my husband and i like 25 years ago and you know he would run and my ex would attempt to run quite poorly with the Olympic boxer. So I've known Mike a very long time and I'm amazed that you, you know, I know you did big things, but you know, as an Olympian, that's 
phenomenal, obviously, and you've put Niagara on the map, but with this, like, wow, it just makes my heart, um, you know, just feel so much more privileged to, to have known you, but to also think that here we here in Little Niagara has somebody like you that has such a big, big heart to be able to give back. And based on um, Heater and your connection, right? Like someone that cared yeah, for you. It all, it all stems from Heater and then meeting these kids. And, you know, so I, I finished the first run 2012. And unfortunately, um, Mateo wasn't there at the end, but I did dip my leg in the Pacific Ocean. And then, um, you know, Mateo passed away shortly after, which was uh, uh, May 8th on uh, 2013. And then I made a promise to him a year to his anniversary of his passing that I would run the other way. So I ended up, you know, oh, wow. Falls, which was 94 marathons, 94 days. So I kind of do something every two years. And then, you know, two years later, in 2016, myself and uh, another counselor, Vic Peter Angelo and Mike DiCianzo and John Vitresca, we attempted to climb the Matterhorn and then... And then just the last couple months ago in 2018, uh, did the Boxer and El Camino, which was just an amazing trail in Spain. And, and uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. And it was kind of last minute. And, you know, so I, I would run every day and dedicate the same to, to a child and did it for Child Cancer Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my sister and I said, Diane, I said, I need, I want to put all these children that I'm going to run for every day starting September 1st to September 30th. And, you know, I wonder if we're going to have 30 children. Well, we had 40 children. Oh, wow. So no 40 children in the Niagara region that has been touched by cancer. And, um, wow. you know, it's, it's crazy. So we had to double up in a couple of days. And, but I gave all the flags to the children and still have a few I have to give to the families. But the most important thing, I think, was just to tell the kids stories mm. every day, to tell these kids. Some can't tell because they have passed away or the parents don't want to you know, it's tough for them. And mm -hmm. they, you know, the only way they get through it sometimes is like, um, Lana Hill is they have uh, a legacy for Kelsey and they, and they, mm -hmm. every day they do something and raising money. So to help other children, but then there's, there's children like, um, Nick Roma and Nick Roma is. Gone. Yes. I, I actually know of Nick. I know of Nick Roma through someone else, but you know, I've heard his story. Yes. Yeah. Nick's lost all his limbs. And yes. Yes. People need to hear this story. And, and, um, you know, I've had a couple people, the parents, and they're saying the one little girl, uh, Brooklyn, she goes, she wants to tell her story. She's so young. Right. To tell her story and to do inspirational talks to people and, and give other children hope. Um, oh, absolutely. It's so, so important that we can't forget about these kids um, mm -hmm. who have passed away or the, the kids that, that have beaten cancer. They need that. People need to hear their stories. And if, and if I can help in that way and, and tell their story until they're able to tell it themselves, I'm more than happy to do that. Oh, absolutely. It's an amazing thing. And then what they've gone through and what they've had to cope with and, you know, how they stay positive, like you said, right? Like um, how, how they mentally at whatever age they are. And so I know some of the ones can be quite young, what they have to do to do their part to do as positive, be as positive as they can be, even though the children, which is a big thing, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's unreal. And you, and you look at these, these kids and I, you know, I go up and, and, and I've seen some of the kids that run McDonald House or McMaster, and I know some of them, and I talk to them, and um, mm. and they're so positive. Like, unbelievable. They can, they'll go and have, they'll go through chemo treatment, and they'll come out and they have a smile on their face, and they're playing with the toy, and I'm just like, wow. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, <laughs> yeah, the it's, power of the power of being in the moment as a child, right? Oh, it just you know, regardless of what's going on. Yeah, yeah they, of course. You know, they don't know what healthy feels like. Some of these children, they think yeah. feeling sick like that is healthy. Right. They think right. that's For normal. Sure. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I, you know, I remember watching Mateo taking 40 pills at a time. And I'm just like, I'm crying about taking one little pill that hurts my stomach. And I'm just like, man, this, this little warrior is just taking all these pills. And he's just like, oh, I'm taking them. Right. Unbelievable. Really is. So, Mike, you know, I, um, I'm inspired. And, I, you know, for everybody listening, um, I want to know where they can go, where they can donate. And also for you speaking, um, to share the story. I mean amazing amazing stuff and i feel like i you know didn't know enough of it but i'm inspired now and in any way and i want to say this out here that if any of those families ever need support i'm here in niagara and i can support any of those families as a um a registered uh, family therapist or a couples therapist pro bono i will assist in any way so if you ever come across that um that i will through you be able to do anything i can to assist because Obviously, it's a hard, crushing thing to lose 
a child or to go through the stresses of being a couple or to, you know, when, when even when the child passes away to be able to reintegrate that family to a lot. So that's something I would hope that I could, you know, give back to you. And um, oh, thank you so much. That, that would be amazing. And you know, that, that is people go, to go on after a child and that's the worst thing in the world. I can't imagine anything worse in the world than losing a child. And it's then the most try difficult. like a normal life, like, okay, yeah. you know I mean? it's, it's impossible. So the, the, the support um, needs to be there. That we can, the, you know, the mental part of it then. You know, absolutely. Help, absolutely. So I'm uh, available. So you, you know how to get a hold of me. So tell people how they can get a hold of you. If um, you know, you need to speak more. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm, <laughs> I have to speak more, Mike. I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart that you have to get this story out there. I'm a, you know, I belong, I'm now a professional speaker in Canada and I, that this message that you are sharing um, needs to get out there uh, across Canada and uh, even in, you know, internationally, because I think it's an inspiration for so many people that would give up. Right. And uh, you know, whether it's cancer or whether it's going through a difficult time because of different things in our lives, that story to learn about resilience, which is what this is about resilience and connection. You made your friend put your shoes on because you knew that mentally you're going to go crazy if you didn't get <laughs> there. Right? Crazy within my own mind. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then, and then you get the positive because then on top of that, he's quit smoking. You see, so the positivity that you put out there in the world, um, you know, has come back and now you're helping all these uh, families and these children. I can imagine what it must do to a child that knows that you're running for them that day. Like what they must be brimming to know that somebody out there is doing this for them and, and then them wanting to tell the story that you're doing that for them. So it's a, it was, uh, really a gift. It was a pleasure. It really was. And if anyone would like to, to, uh, to donate or get a hold of me, just go to boxrun.org uh, and, uh, um, if you'd like me to come in and speak, and I, I would be more than happy to uh, to share my story and share the children's stories. Awesome. Well, Michael, it's uh, it's been amazing. I uh, feel privileged to have uh, spent this time because I know you and I see each other like in passing sometimes in Niagara Falls. I see you when you're at council meetings on, on TV and stuff like that. That's about it. But I'll I'll make sure to try to reach out to you more. So for everybody listening, I, I guess I'm struck um, by I talk about being authentic and I think Mike, Mike has shown that, you know, when you are truly connected to who you are and you connect to other people on a profound level, amazing things happen. And um, this through the box run is an example of something like that. And a, a legacy that you're leaving behind that nobody can ever, ever take away. And this idea got birth in, in Mike through a connection and the importance of us being connected, not just to ourselves, um, based on whatever we're going through in the world, but also to others is the thing that affords us to be resilient. So again, Mike, thanks so much for being here. And do reach out to Mike mm -hmm. and the box. So it's boxrun.org. And if you're needing uh -huh. anything further from me, uh, you can reach me at roxanderhodge.com uh, forward slash blueprint, where you can download a free course on how to be a bit more connected to yourself. Okay, so take care. and. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Roxanne. Okay. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.